welcome to City Scene with Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. And Mike, welcome. Hi, Walt. Good to be here. Good to have you here. And uh, I would just want to share with our viewers that today we are going to be talking about the middle school project and specifically about the demolition of the old building and the start of the construction of the new building. And uh, Mike, you've brought two guests with you today, and I'd like to introduce them. First, we have Bob Gilchrist, and Bob with, is with Agostini and Bacon, who are the construction manager on the project. Yes. And we also have uh, Troy Randall, and Troy Randall is with the architectural firm AI3. He's one of the principals of, uh, of that company. And before we get into the, into the meat of the, of the questions, I'd like to have these two gentlemen uh, briefly explain what your role is in, in the entirety, kind of position it in, in, with view of the entire project. So, Bob, you want to start that one uh, first? What, what is Agostini and Bacon? What is your role? Sure. Thank you, Walt. Um, we are, have been hired as the consultant construction managers on the project. Um, we were brought on uh, about the middle of last year. Um, we helped with the design during the uh, design phase, during the design development, uh, doing cost estimating to help with the scope of the project, um, reviewing the plans and specs to be sure that they, you know, uh, we can build the building and that we're within budget. And uh, we developed schedules along the way during the design process. And then we also uh, manage any of the construction process um, as we go forward during the project. As well as the demolition process. Absolutely. Demolition <laughs> is the first phase of uh, construction <laughs> for us. And we'll talk about that in, in a second. And uh, uh, Troy, we, we know Troy. Bev Kim has worked with uh, Troy and, and AI3 here in the last uh, several months. But Troy, tell us uh, what AI3's uh, role has been in this project so far. Quite a significant role, I might add. Sure. Thank you, Walt. Yes. Um, uh, we're uh, with AI3 Architects, and uh, we were hired by the city to oversee the entire design process with all of the consultants, the interaction with the Massachusetts School Building Authority, um, and um, with the uh, start of construction moving through the design um, to the final design coming in later this uh, this year. All right. Yeah. And I know that you have been participating on the uh, building school building committee and uh, how uh, they've been meeting what on a, on a monthly basis, Mike? So we've got there there are several parts to this. Now we meet weekly. Uh, by we I mean the superintendent of schools, the mayor, m me as mayor, the uh, our commissioner of public services Mike Collins, our finance director Brian Ailes, and we bring in other department heads as needed. Uh, so we meet with AI3, with Agostini and Bacon, and with our owner's project manager, Heary, who's been with us from the start of the project. Uh, and the bulk of the work gets done by the professionals we've hired. Architects design the building. Uh, Agostini and Bacon build the building. And, you know, together with the project manager, they, they all interact, and, and, and they, uh, uh, they have done a great job of beating timelines and saving money to date and putting... Uh, you know, putting a great plan forward. The school building committee is a group of, uh, of volunteers who meet um, not quite monthly, probably eight or nine times a year, uh, and we've been meeting for a couple of years, and their role of, as volunteers is to, to help kind of uh, ensure that all the due diligence and all the steps are covered um, throughout the process. All right. Now, um, I'm going to, right now as we sit here, it's, it's March 1st, uh, 2016, and uh, I believe uh, just a few days ago, the actual demolition of the old building was uh, started. And um, uh, Bob, let me just address this question to you. With a building of this age and, and at this point, what, what are some of the issues involved in tearing down a building like, like the old Memorial School? Um, one of the greatest challenges is the, um, the, some of the building materials that we used in the early 50s when the original building was built. Um, including the asbestos that you find within within building materials. Um, you know, floor tiles back then, pipe insulation, things like that, um, had asbestos in them, um, and they need to be removed from the building before you can start any demolition. Uh, the better part of the last two months, we started on January 4th, um, removing the asbestos out of the building. Um, prior to removing any asbestos, we put the entire area under containment. We wrapped the entire area in plastic. Um, we have fans that uh, uh, provide a vacuum or a negative pressure inside the area to contain uh, any of the uh, products that might become airborne, and they, so they're contained 
Um, all of the waste, any of the asbestos waste is, uh, is contained um, inside of uh, typically the fiber or plastic containers and bags. Um, and it's all boxed up and, and put in trailers and uh, hauled to a licensed disposal facility out in Ohio. Okay. So just to be clear, uh, while the asbestos is in there in the building while it was being used since the 50s, it's okay because it's contained and it's sealed. But once you kind of break that barrier, which, which the people did, and, and these are the guys with the, with the suits, with the hazmat suits and, and all of that stuff. And how long, how long did that take, Bob, to do that? Uh, the, con the removal of the um, asbestos took uh, the better part of two months, January and February. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the asbestos is inside the boilers, so there's actually some dismantling that takes place. Some of the asbestos was on pipe insulation underneath the building. So not a, either one of those areas were not exposed to any of the building occupants uh, for the better part of the occupancy of the building, uh, but they still needed to be removed properly from the building. Right. Um, and as you said, the asbestos in a floor tile itself is not hazardous. It's when the materials are disturbed that you um, introduce the potential for that uh, waste to become airborne and then become right. a problem, which is why you contain that waste as it's being removed um, and then you package it and contain it um, uh, for proper disposal. Right. And just uh, as you mentioned, uh, that waste will not remain in this area. It's going to a special remediation facility that's equipped especially to take care of this kind of, uh, this kind of asbestos and this kind of waste, correct? That's correct. The entire process, including the transportation from the site to the disposal facility in Ohio, um, is, is closely regulated. All of the trucks will be lined, uh, all of the waste stays packaged, and it's a very close uh, monitoring procedure that takes place until it gets to uh, the disposal landfill out in Ohio where, again, it's, uh, it's managed and contained and uh, closely monitored as it's disposed of properly. Okay. And now, uh, prior to this also, because right now they're starting to tear down the, the, the superstructure. The, so inside the building, uh, all of the fixtures have been taken out. To, what, what does the inside of the building look like right now? Uh, right now, the inside of the old memorial building uh, looks pretty much like an empty concrete shell. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, in the auditorium, all the seats have been removed, all the carpeting's been removed, the stage flooring's been removed, the wall finishes have been removed, um, and all that waste that comes out of the building is all segregated as well. Uh, we separate all the metal waste from the wood waste from the trash, um, and we recycle as much as we possibly can um, of the construction debris that comes off the site. Mm -hmm. In the last 10 years, our average recycling rate is somewhere in excess of 90 percent. So by weight of uh, the materials that we dispose off the site, somewhere in the order of 94, 95 percent is actually recycled. We recycle the metal, um, we recycle the wood um, as much as we possibly can. All of the concrete and masonry debris, that's all crushed and recycled and reused as much okay. as possible. Okay. So things like uh, air conditioners and conduits and fans and different things like that, they've all been taken out? They've all been taken out. Uh, the demo contractor will actually recycle as much copper wiring, as much copper piping. Uh, they'll salvage as much as they possibly can. Uh, they'll reuse whatever they can throughout the building and then salvage and recycle as much as they possibly can. Yeah, interesting. Now, we were out there this morning, uh, and uh, just as the big cat uh, began, I think that's the first part of the outside of the building that, that's uh, been demolished, right? So we're going to share with our audience a little bit of footage we took this morning uh, right at the front of the memorial building as the big cat started to knock down the front facade. So uh, have a look at this.
So this big, uh, this big cat here, is that something that is owned by, by your company, uh, Bob, or, or is this a leased piece of equipment? Uh, tell us about this, this monster out here. As a, the construction manager on the project, we would typically hire specialty contractors. Um, we've hired American Environmental out of uh, Springfield, Mass., as our asbestos abatement and demolition contractor. Uh, they brought this machine in. I'm not exactly sure if it's uh, if they own it or they've uh, leased it for the project. It's a large machine um, aimed at being able to reach the top of the three-story building and to be able to separate and segregate waste and uh, to manage the demolition process as the building comes down. And we can see here on the on the footage where uh, there's a kind of a constant stream of water being played on the uh, on, on the debris. Tell us why that's done. Um, we, we take extreme efforts to try to control any amount of dust that's on the site. So what you're seeing, we've actually got two fire hoses set up on site for dust control. Uh, the waste is um, kept dry, uh, as you saw in the video. Um, as the building comes down, concrete breaks apart. Uh, you've got materials that have been there for 60 or 70 years that are breaking apart, and you do get some dust, but our, our goal is to contain that and to wet everything down as it, goes, uh, as it comes down off the building. Mm -hmm. Now, th this particular phase now, and, and anybody here can, can chime in, this particular phase, when, when do you expect that the, that the building as it stands now will be completely, completely demolished, completely torn down? Any, any date, any um, target date for that? The demolition is targeted to be completed in April. Um, as of uh, April 2nd, the beginning of April, uh, we expect the entire classroom building to be down. Uh, the only thing that may be standing as of the 1st of April um, is the gymnasium. Uh, that's the last piece that will come down, um, and then that will be down probably by the middle to the end of April, and all the demolition of the building will be, uh, will be complete um, six to eight weeks from right now. Okay. And, uh, Mike, Mr. Mayor, uh, the, uh, the construction of a new building uh, that will begin immediately after, after all of this debris is hauled away, tell us, tell us what, how that's supposed to happen. So the schedule for this calendar year is for the building to be knocked down, <clears throat> and as Bob said, you know, hopefully that all completes sometime in April, to be followed by the driving and piles. Because the memorial site is on clay, clay is not something you can build on, you know, just and just sit the, the you know the building on it. So we'll be driving about 1,200 piles down through clay into bedrock, uh, and that's all very. Uh, Bob can better explain it to you, so I'll let him. Uh, but a after that, uh, after the piles go in, then foundations start to get poured over the piles. Uh, and then by later this calendar year, you'll see the, uh, the structural steel uh, going up above ground, and that'll continue through the winter. Mm -hmm. So, Bob, tell us about the pile. How far down do they have to go before they reach bedrock? Um, we've uh, done some probes on the site and working with uh, AI3 <laughs> architects and their consultants. And... Uh, you know, the section of the building closest to Cabot Street will be down about 40, 45 feet. Um, and we'll go down as far as 75, 80 feet in some portions of the site uh, to hit bedrock. It, it's kind of irregular underneath the site, uh, but we've done enough borings and probes throughout the site to know that uh, uh, on average we'll probably be about 60 feet for a, uh, a steel pile uh, driven all the way down to bedrock. Mm -hmm. And what, what's the diameter of, of, this, of this pile, of, of these piles? We, we're going with a, um, with a steel H pile or an I-beam, if you will, um, that's <clears throat> approximately... Um, 12 inches by 12 inches, roughly. Okay. Um, it's for this type of work with piles. It's more driven by the bearing capacity of the pile. So we look at it as a 65-ton pile that each pile driven can support that kind of weight, as opposed to designing a specific size of pile. Okay. So it's not actually a round cylinder. It's actually an I beam. That's it's actually that's going an I beam that's driven down into the ground. Correct. Mm -hmm. And how far into bedrock does it go? Um, typically, on the top of bedrock, you'll have a soft layer, which ca is called a weathered bedrock layer. Mm -hmm. um, and the information that we've got from the probes on site to date uh, shows us that that layer is limited to about a foot or two. Uh, so we'll drive the uh, into solid bedrock only about a foot or two until uh, we get through that fractured layer, and we're and we're resting on solid bedrock. Mm -hmm. And you have you have what special kind of machines that just kind of pound this pound this down through the ground and into the. Any dynamiting uh, that might be going on? No, we're, no. Uh, we will actually drive the pile down through the clay, and uh, some of the testing on site to date has uh, revealed that that will actually be a relatively easy process. Mm -hmm. It's a very soft clay in some areas. 
Um, and just to give you an idea, on a typical day, uh, the subcontractor that we hire to drive the piles is estimating that they'll be driving up to 25 piles per day oh, wow. um, of 60 to 65 feet long. So they're expecting quite a bit of production in a day, primarily because of the soft soils underneath the ground. And will they, they be like in a regular grid underneath the, the, uh, the footprint of the building, kind of spaced every 10 or 12 feet apart or something like that? It's, uh, it's more driven around the, uh, the grid lines of the building and the column oh, lines of the okay. building. So um, we've got, uh, once we drive the piles, some will be in clusters of two, three, six, eight, and then we'll put a cap, a concrete cap on top of that, and then that'll carry the weight of the building up above that. In large areas like the gymnasium or the auditorium where you have large slab areas, we'll actually have individual piles uh, spread throughout that wide open space to carry the slab. Uh, we're putting a structural slab down under the building and it'll be completely supported uh, by the piles driven down to the bedrock. Uh -huh. Very interesting, very interesting. And Mike, we, we talked before about the things that were inside the building that are no longer there. And I know I've gotten uh, calls here, we've gotten calls here at BevCamp. People want to know their plaques and trophies sure. and memorabilia and all that stuff. Where, where will that be or where is that right now and where is it planned to be? Everything, memorial plaques and, and, uh, and such have all been removed and are being stored for safekeeping and then we'll, we'll look at how and where to best display those in the future as the, as the new school gets built. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Now, Troy, let me, let me kind of <laughs> talk to you. We've uh, not heard from you during this uh, interview, but um, talk about the design of the building. Is the final design absolutely set in concrete, or are there still uh, certain design issues that need to be decided upon where we sit now, March 1st? Yeah, there, there are uh, many design issues or design uh, elements that um, have yet to be decided. Um, many have. We've been through the process about uh, 18 months uh, since the beginning, since we were um, uh, hired on board. And um, that when I, when I talk about uh, being the designer, being the manager of the design process, we have, um, uh, as part of that process, worked with the, uh, the city, the district administration, the faculty and staff, uh, as we start to formulate the building plan uh, to make sure that all of the consultants, the structural engineers, the uh, mechanical, electrical, fire protection, plumbing, uh, and the site consultants all make sure that what the uh, city and the district uh, desires as far as the building program and the educational program is implemented into the uh, process. So we're, right now we are uh, about two-thirds of the way through the design process mm -hmm. and uh, what a milestone that's coming up is the 60 percent construction documents uh, and that's a milestone that uh, is significant. It's um, one step in the uh, construction document process um, as we continue uh, toward 100% construction documents. So for our viewers, when you say 60%, maybe some of our viewers don't exactly understand. What, what, sure. what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of if, that the viewers would understand? Sure. Uh, yeah, the, uh, at 60% construction documents, it's a transition where the uh, building footprint has been established, the location of the building uh, has been established, the adjacencies of the program, whether that's the gymnasium adjacent to the auditorium, uh, the classroom clusters, uh, the neighborhoods, all of those uh, spaces have been identified in a building footprint. The um, overall concept of the exterior uh, has been developed and designed. Uh, it's at a point where uh, the mechanical systems, the electrical systems, the fire protection, the plumbing systems have, been, have begun to uh, take shape and now it's a process of detailing the design in greater detail. As an example, uh, taking a look at how the wall system is constructed, uh, the exterior wall as well as the interior walls, how ceiling systems are uh, being designed and detailed relative to other components of the building. Right. Yep. Well, very good. Thank you for that. And now, your um, AI3, this is your expertise, school buildings, uh, is it not? Yeah. Correct, yeah. And, and I know typically uh, a middle school is a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, but this one is five through, five through eight. Uh, is that, does that pose any difference in how you approach the design of the, of the building? The, um, and there, a lot of work um, 
It, it does in the effect that uh, with this particular project, it was uh, extremely important, I go back to the educational program, the implement, implementation of the educational program and making sure that there's a 5-6 academy and a 7-8. And, eight. and um, uh, the breakdown of the, uh, the school of 1,395 students, breaking it down into smaller cohort um, uh, neighborhoods was an extremely important uh, component of the educational program in the district. Um, uh, the district's uh, uh, documentation in the city did a lot of work prior to us even coming on board right, to uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, to work through that process. The, the, yeah, just, to, Michael, just to clarify, share that there are K to eight schools. There are seven and eight middle schools. There are six eight. There are a lot of five to eight middle schools in in Massachusetts. And in fact, Linfield, Swampscott, and Wakefield are three of our neighbors who have five to eight uh, middle schools. So <clears throat> we spent quite a bit of time two plus years ago. Um, ensuring that that a five day middle school would meet the social and emotional and educational needs of our kids, we wouldn't have gone this direction if, if it if it didn't if it couldn't. Uh, and and done right, five day middle schools can be incredibly advantageous uh, for for our kids. Fifth graders have access. In fact, what we're looking at in creating these five, six, and seven, eight academies is trying to provide. Um, through, with core education, with um, with other types of elective classes, and then outside the school day with elect with um, extracurriculars, we're trying to provide significantly greater opportunities for fifth graders than they would have had otherwise. Right. Uh, and when you can create five, six extracurriculars and, and and sports and student government opportunities and such, and seven and eight separately, now you've you've got an engagement for all the kids in the school in a better way. But the core of it is that the academics work and the social emotional development works when you create these separate five, six, seven, eight academies. It doesn't mean that the fifth graders will never interact with eighth graders, but that'll, that'll all be very structured and controlled. In fact, there are great opportunities for older middle school kids to mentor younger middle school kids, again, when it's structured and part of the, you know, part of the program. Right, very good. Well, Mike, thank you for sharing that with our sure. viewers. Very, very insightful. Um, so, uh, uh, Troy, back to you. So, uh, for the next six or eight months, what, what is your workload, what does AI3's workload look like in terms of this project? Yeah, so the, um, the next six to eight months, um, we will be completing the 100% construction documents, working to uh, the end of September. Uh, early on in the process, when we uh, work through the discussions related to construction manager at risk, the concept was to uh, uh, start construction and uh, uh, demolish the building and identify through the uh, design process several early packages that could be released uh, to the contractor, the uh, construction manager, Agostini Bacon, to uh, keep things uh, on site moving forward. And that's what you see in the video, that's what you see uh, on site now. And so we'll be working through actually um, uh, the pile uh, submission which um, uh, Bob uh, spoke about earlier, right. and then the structural steel submission, early package, uh, in the next few months. So that will continue the process of um, uh, the erection of the steel and seeing the building take form uh, three-dimensionally, and then working through the construction documents until the uh, end of September. And once the end of September comes along, that um, uh, design process is completed, the building design is completed, and uh, simultaneously you'll see the construction, the erection of the steel uh, a little bit later in, uh, uh, in the fall and uh, uh, in uh, early winter. That's when it really, from, from a design of the new building, that's when it really gets exciting because you'll start to see the volumes and the shapes and yeah. the, the yeah. connection of uh, spaces start to take form. Uh, it's exciting now to see the demolition of the existing building. <laughs> it's also exciting to see the uh, construction and evolution yeah. of the new building. Yeah. Well, let me, let me have, uh, have our mayor, have Mike kind of take over from there. So um, what does the overall project schedule look like right now? Now, the, 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 uh, you're supposed to have students come in there in, in September of 2019, is that correct? 
2018. 18, excuse me, 2018. <laughs> Don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so kind of uh, let us know where do we stand right now in the overall project in terms of schedule and and uh, and, and and do we can we meet that? Will we meet that uh, schedule? Sure. So I asked Bob weekly, he can, he can attest, <laughs> I asked him weekly how we're doing with this piece and this piece in our schedule. Everything is on schedule, everything is on budget in the sense that, um, you know, we've been meeting and beating timelines for a couple of years and we've been saving money as we go with, with, different, uh, with different pieces and, and that's an incredible credit to these, to these professionals. Our, our project manager here international, the folks at AI3, the folks at Agostini Bacon, we we hired them for a reason. They were our first choice in each instance, and we're, we're, we've been happy with their work. Uh, we have a great, a great team that's come together. Um, and right now, we are on track. We, we fully expect that we'll remain on track, both time-wise and budget-wise. That's, that's our job. Mm -hmm. um, and the plan is that the building will be ready for occupancy by early summer 2018 so that we can have an orderly opening to school in September of 2018. And remember, when we go into this new building, the fifth graders will leave the elementary schools. So the five elementary schools will also have that summer of 2018 to reconfigure, right. and they'll gain back space that, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all working hard at it, and great education is going on in our elementaries and at Briscoe. But we know that once we get into this new building and we ease the space crunch at the elementaries, everything will flow even better. Right. Now, you mentioned budget a couple of times, and maybe I'll ask you for the benefit of our viewers, maybe to elucidate a little bit on that, how, how you expect to come in vis-a-vis uh, -vis budget for the entire project as you see it now. Right. Well, we, we reached a project funding agreement with the state, uh, and our city council voted in, you know, unanimously to support funding the project. We'll be spending just about $61 million, and the state will be spending about 49. So that's, you know, that's now, there was a time when the state suggested they were going to pay more than half, but uh, that's not happening in any district anywhere to be found. Um, they have some um, challenges with funding at the state level, and they handle things a little differently than they used to talk about. We've understood that for some time, and, uh, and so our ability to fund this project has been clear. Uh, Former administration, Bill Scanlon's administration, and now mine for the last couple of years, we've been working hard to make sure that our capital, um, our capital program can handle what we're doing today and what we'll do next and what we'll do next. And uh, and we've we built a rainy day fund in excess of, it's close to seven million dollars in rainy day funds right now, and we expect it will get up to a significantly higher number before we would even have to consider tapping it for this project, which we may or may not end up tapping it at all for this project. Yeah. So we have about a minute left. Uh, Mayor, any, any final, or gentlemen, any final words that you want to share with our viewers in the last minute or so? Why don't, why don't you guys just, just share your, your excitement for the project and your assurances that it will come in as we all predict it will. <laughs> I, I just think, I think the exciting, uh, I mean, it's exciting to um, work with the city, the district, to uh, to formulate and create this building, uh, it's going to be even more exciting uh, to see it come to life and to see how the uh, the, the students in Beverly are going to thrive within the uh, uh, this building and the way the way the teaching and learning is going to evolve uh, with the uh, original setup of the um, educational program. It's really um, it's really fascinating, and exciting. Fantastic, yeah. And from our perspective, it's a great team. As the mayor said, not only Heary, AI3, uh, the city, and Agostini Bacon, but also all the local officials that we've dealt with. It's been a real cooperative effort. Everything has been positive. We've moved forward. We've met every deadline so far, and we're uh, confident that we're going to do so moving forward. Very good. Well, I'd like to thank our viewers for watching, and I'd like to thank our guest, Mayor Mike Cahill, as usual, and Bob Gilchrist from Agostini in Bacon, the construction manager, and Troy Randall from AI3 Architects. And I'd like to remind you that you've been watching City Scene with Mayor Mike Cahill. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski. Thank you for watching.